Hey, you want to play with your toy? Want to play with your toy? The toe nun has a toy similar to that. Welcome everybody to the Church of the Tone Priest. Today we're going back to the future. Actually, we're going, uh, we're in the future and we're going back to the past. I don't know, I think it was episode four of that series. I'm from the future. Um, what we have here is the amplifier that started it all for me. It's a modern Fender Champion 600, I believe it is called. And go back about three years ago and I was, uh, building effects pedals and my buddy was like hey I got this amplifier here that's not working maybe you can take a look at it and so I took a look at it and I saw an Uncle Doug video where it was converted from you know the modern green PCB made in China form into a nice hand wired example of a tweed fender champ amplifier now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Oh, I was like, I could do that. Uh, well, I thought I could. This damn thing doesn't work at all. Uh, anyway, so that was this is the one that started it all. And let me tell you, it's not as easy as it looks. Had some problems. Uh, I rebuilt this thing like two or three times from the bottom up, and. Kept having a couple of issues with it. Let me turn this around. So it does work. It's covered in the tone pads here. Um, but the main problem I had with it, and the reason why I haven't returned it to the owner yet, is because when you turn it up past a certain way, it starts oscillating. And at the time, I didn't know what oscillation was. And I reached out on to some forums, uh, for some help on how to fix that. And of course everybody was like, oh, negative feedback, negative feedback, negative feedback. I don't think it's negative feedback. I recently bumped into a video by D-Lab Electronics and he showed an amplifier where if you turn the treble up past a certain way, you would get what is called parasitic oscillation. And I think that's what we have here. We have parasitic oscillation and I'm hoping um, some grid blockers, grid stoppers, Grid stopper resistors will solve the problem. But we're going to tear this apart and we're going to look at uh, the quality of my work from three years ago, which I'm sure is substandard. So while we're fixing the oscillation on the volume, we're going to uh, rebuild it, hopefully the final time. And we're going to get rid of the turret board. We're going to do this point to point because we can and it's cool. So if that all sounds interesting to you, not sure why it would, but if it does, hang tight. Here we go. All right, let's get this back door off. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can see what I was, uh, well, I don't even know what I was trying to do there. I think that was trying to eliminate some hum this thing was getting. Um, we have an eminence. 620H, 6-inch six speaker. Probably overkill for this amplifier. But we'll rebuild it and try it out again and uh, maybe replace that. Uh, what else we got going on here? Oh, yeah. Of course, you know, the very first project you do in your life, you want to overcomplicate it as much as possible. So I had selectable tube and solid-state rectification, as you do on a freaking Class A amp. Because why not? Um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun in here. Memory lane. All right, here's the tubes we had installed in here. We had a modern Sobtec 5Y3. We had this beautiful Sylvania black plate 6V6. This thing looks NOS. Looks like it's never been used before. That's nice. That's too good for the owner. And this was his tube that um, he had in the amp originally. It's a GE 5751. And as I mentioned, we were having the parasitic oscillation. The other problem with the uh, amp was it was just way too much gain. With the 12AX7 and the 5751, it was just, you know, miniaturized friggin' Sepultura. Um, 
Um, it did sound pretty good with a 12AY7, but I'm not sure, you know, even just hitting the volume past, you know, like three, would just make this thing completely saturated. Um, not exactly sure why that is. I think the speaker has something to do with it. I believe this is a, a very high efficiency little speaker. You know, it's got a big giant magnet on it and stuff. Oh, has it washer stuck to the magnet? Um, but once we rebuild it, we'll adjust that um, when we uh, get to that point in the project. Ooh, we got ceramic tube sockets as well. Those need to go. Yeah, mistakes were made. Here's the underside of the chassis. As you can see, there's uh, some extra holes. That's what she said. Um, because I was adding a rectifier tube that the original didn't have. The original was solid state diode rectified. Um, had to cut some more holes and move some stuff around to make it all work, make it all fit. And I don't know what this chassis is made of, if it's stainless or hardened steel, but it was an absolute nightmare. I was using hole saws and a hand drill, and it, ugh, still have nightmares about that. Uh, here's the pot for the variable negative feedback, because again, first time you're doing something, you want to make it as complicated as possible. A couple of classic tone transformers. I bought these new, so... It lets you know how long ago I did this project. And then this was to select between tube and solid state rectification. Flip her over, see how we did. And it's not a complete cluster bomb. Not a complete cluster bomb. Had some weird ideas about things. Um, you had very high quality with very mediocre quality capacitors. Yeah, I think this wire I used, I went to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, and I bought some, you know, electrician's cable that had, you know, like eight different conductors in it. So solid core, like 18 gauge wire here. That's what I was using. Oh, yeah. So we definitely had some strange ideas about things. Memory lane right here. Oh yeah, we're using quick connects on the fuse holder. Yeah, all, all good quality shit. Alright, let's start stripping this down. Got the board out. As you can see, we use the blue uh, metal resistors. Amazon specials, I'm sure. These were our standoffs. Good stuff there. Wrote down the exact um, resistance on the power tubes cathode bias resistor so we could bias it. It's a nice touch. So you didn't do everything wrong. And uh, yeah, don't uh, go out and get the, the, the ceramic um, tube sockets of fucking garbage. So I recommend, you know, Belton's. Uh, I got some grounds over there. Yeah, this switch is ridiculous. We're going to have to buy some parts, so. This video is going to take a few weeks to produce, but for you, it'll be seamless. Cool stuff. Memory lane. We're destroying our memories. And nice alpha pot right there. I just broke something under here. No. Where the hell did these come from? Yeah. All right. Moving on. Happy Sunday morning. I went digging through the parts bin here at the Tone Church, and I think I found enough parts to build this thing, so we're not going to order new parts. We're going to use what we have on hand. Found a couple of uh, shorting jacks. Um, we're going to use this ceramic tube socket. It'll be fine. And this uh, one is actually a pull from an old Magnavox console radio that was in my landlord's junk pile a long time ago. Uh, recycling the 16 microfarad capacitor from the original board, that guy there. And I have a couple of 10 microfarad F&Ts here, so we'll use those. Those will be fine. 
So we're going to carry on and uh, let's build a champ on a Sunday. All right, so I'm working on the power supply of this amplifier. And I was thinking of what we wanted to do with this video. And I thought that because the Fender Champ is usually the first project that many aspiring amp builders do, as it was mine, that we just go over some uh, basics. You know, not getting very granular, just some, you know, real basic stuff here uh, that would hopefully help people out. All right, so you'll notice right here, we're using a blue resistor and a gray resistor. And uh, this is what I had in stock, so I didn't choose blue specifically for this one or gray for this one. It's just what I have in stock. But let me show you on the schematic. This is where we're at. So what happens is you plug your amplifier into the wall. goes through the power transformer. So we start with 120 volts AC. goes through the 5Y3 rectifier tube. And that turns it into DC voltage. And that goes into the filter caps. And the filter caps feed the different sections of the circuit. This first filter cap is going to feed your output transformer, which feeds the plate of your output tube. And what the filter caps do is, so when the voltage comes in from the wall, it's an AC wave. Looks like this. And what the filter caps do is they they fill up like a battery with a charge. And the rectifier will turn that into DC, which is just supposed to be a straight line. But it's not perfect. It's still a little bumpy. And what these do is help smooth out the bumps. They help to get rid of ripple. All right, but we have this first filter cap here. He's feeding the output transformer. Then we have this dropping resistor with another filter cap, dropping resistor, and then the third and final filter cap. So that's what these are here. Now I selected, this is a metal film and this is a metal oxide resistor. And I selected this kind because they are more robust than the carbon style resistors. And if you can see here, we're going to have 365 volts of DC going through this part of the circuit here. And this 10K resistor right here, which is gonna be this guy right here, he's gonna be lowering the voltage from 365 down to 317. So he's basically taking voltage, turning some of it into heat, and then passing on what's left over. And you want these to be very robust in this position here. So there are generally four kinds of resistors. We have the old school carbon composition. Those are the brown ones that look like this. We have carbon film, which are beige, like that guy there. And we have our metal film. You see that? Get some light on there. Metal film, those are the blue ones. And our metal oxide ones. I don't know if that's coming through well, but there you go. So might be asking, why not just use the metal ones, if they're stronger and more robust, for our, all your resistors in your circuit? Well, apparently, and I don't know how true this is, I don't know if anyone's done a scientific Pepsi challenge on this, the carbon composition, the old school ones, um, sound the best. They have the best tone for your circuit. And many people want to see those and use those. But they don't last as long. They're not as robust. You can see here, these are 2-watt carbon composition resistors. They're kind of humongous. They take up a lot of space. Whereas the 2-watt metal film are significantly smaller. So, the power supply does not affect your tone whatsoever as far as changing your tone. I mean, if you have a bad power supply, you'll have ripple and that'll have, you know, that will affect your tone negatively but it doesn't really affect the signal of your guitar. So we want to go ahead and use these. And then on the other parts of the circuit where the type of resistor you use does or could theoretically, anecdotally affect your tone, we'll go ahead and use those up there where that is the case. Hopefully that makes sense. And uh, as we progress in this video, we'll talk a little bit more 
you know, about what all these things you're doing. So you can kind of have uh, wrap your head around what's going on here if this is your first time. All right, moving on. Hope that was helpful. Son of a bitch. You know, you really no help at all. You know that? Uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Um, nowadays, a lot of people, you know, instead of using the carbon composition resistors, they'll use carbon film resistors, the beige ones, because they're a good compromise, you know, in robustness without losing as much tone mojo. So, there you go. Another consideration when selecting resistors is the, the watts rating. And what that is, is watts is a, a measure of power, which is basically heat, uh, especially in this instance. How much power or heat it can dissipate before it starts to melt. I think generally, back in the day, Fender used half-watt resistors for everything. Uh, I like to build my amps like a tank, so I try to use one-watt resistors uh, for everything. And the only exceptions where you need beefier resistors are these dropping resistors, which we probably want to do two or three watt resistors, and then your power tube cathode bias resistor, where we're going to go ahead and use a five watt. That's a big white cement looking one. All right, there you go. All right, what we're going to do now is we are going to connect the power transformer to the rectifier tube socket. And there are two sets of wires that need to go to the socket. So there's four connections. The two red wires get connected to pins four and six, which are for the plates of the rectifier tube. And the plates are the big gray things you see in there. Wow, this is a neat looking tube. It's got like a whole bunch of fins. Pretty cool, right? Can you see that? Nah, you can't see shit. Um, and the other two wires are for the heaters. Now, most of your tubes run on 6.3 volt heaters, but the rectifier tube is a 5Y3, and the first number in the name of a tube is the voltage it takes. So, 6V6, 6 volt heaters, 5Y3, 5 volt heaters. So, the two wires coming off the power transformer are going to pins 2 and 8. And then, off of one of those pins, we're going to run a wire. And that is going to send DC voltage for everything, all the plates of all the other tubes in this circuit. All right, and here we are. We got our two 5 volt windings and our high voltage windings off of the power transformer. We're going to go ahead and hook those up. And there's going to be. Oop, I just dropped the capacitor. Off of one of the 5 volt filament connections here on the socket. We see it goes up to the first filter cap. So we're actually going to take our 16 microfarad capacitor and we're going to hook them straight up like that. Right to the socket itself. And then he's going to land over here on this guy over here. And then we have our first dropping resistor and second dropping resistor. So that's the 10k first dropping resistor. Oh, you can't see that. Here's our 10K first dropping resistor, and then our 22K second dropping resistor, and our second and our third filter caps. All right, time to break out the soldering iron. All right, a little progress update here. We're almost done. This is pretty quick and easy. Uh, these days, I remember the first time I built this thing, it took me days and days and days. You know, and that's when I had a layout and a tarot board and everything else following instructions found on the internet, but I'm um, just kind of winging it, doing it point to point, and it's coming right along pretty quickly. A couple of things I added was a uh, screen resistor and a grid stopper. I believe this grid stopper will help with the oscillation, but we're almost there. Little progress update, we're almost done. I basically just need to hook up the primary side of the power transformer, and she ain't pretty. You know, doing a point-to-point -point build for the first time and without, you know, a layout or anything. Just kind of, it's like playing 4D chess. I'll have you checkmated your next move. <laughs> and 
this is the project I'm doing while I'm in between projects. So I want to, I wanted to kind of bang it out, you know, before the end of this weekend. So she ain't pretty. Uh, the ground scheme is, uh, I wanted to do a ground scheme like I did, uh, well, I, not like I did, but like the RCA that I did had, which was a ground bus bar. And then everything very methodically connected to that. And it was all connected to the chassis at one point. This is more of a star ground. Uh, the first filter cap has its own ground here. But everything else is kind of star grounding to here. And then its uh, connection to the chassis is at the second input jack. It's probably going to be noisy. I got some, you know, grid wires going here and there. I get the negative feedback kind of next to the transformer and the rectifier. But... Yeah, we'll fire up, see how it sounds, and, you know, if it's noisy and, you know, unwieldy, unruly, we'll address it then. But it should work, and it should be cool. So we just got to get a fuse holder back in here, um, on-off switch, and then, you know, hook this shit up, and we'll be able to fire it up, see how we did. All right, before we move on to finishing up the wiring of this amplifier, getting to the primary of the power transformer... I figured we'd finish our discussion about how the circuit works. And uh, again, don't take my word as gospel. I'm sure I misspoke here and there. Uh, I am not an amp tech. I am not an engineer. I'm a hobbyist. So a lot of these things, I know enough to get it to work. But the real nuts and bolts and science and engineering in it, you know, there are huge gaps in my understanding. So this is just a starting point for you to further and continue your own education into this and then finally in no way am i advocating somebody tear apart your amplifier and start working on it if you are not absolutely 110 percent comfortable and confident in the safety procedures of working on a vacuum tube amplifier then you have absolutely no business sticking your hands in there Fuck, shit. um before i ever worked on guitar electronics I worked in a completely different electrical field doing electrical work so and I also went to um, tech school for this you know a million zillion years ago um, and when I did become interested in working on guitar stuff the very first video I watched was well, two videos were you know what the heck is a death capacitor and how to safely bias a tube amp um, both of videos of which were Uncle Doug we love Uncle Doug Okay, so I was thinking, you know, when I'm learning a new skill, learning something new, something that helps me or hinders me, depending upon how you want to look at it, is just not knowing how much stuff there is to know. To that end, talking about resistors again, there are basically only four different uh, functions a resistor does in a tube amplifier. So we talked about the dropping resistors, where you'll get a high voltage in. Uh, it'll go through the resistor. The resistor will resist the voltage. It'll bleed off some of that voltage's heat. And then on, on the other side, you'll get a bit, little bit smaller voltage. Now, this here is actually a kind of voltage divider. Uh, that's well beyond the scope of this video. If you're interested in that, go to your search function and type in Kirchhoff. I believe it's spelled K-I-R-S-H-O-F. Maybe two Fs. I'm not sure. It'll figure it out. Anyway, um, type that in your search function, and we'll see you in a few weeks. All right, so that's type one, dropping resistor. The second one we talked about was the grid stopper. All right, and again, that acts as a low-pass filter to eliminate high frequencies and to keep the tube from oscillating. The third type was the grid leak resistor. And again, when the signal, the AC signal comes in, it has no place to go. What it's doing as the signal comes in is allowing the flow of electrons from the cathode to the plate or blocking it. And because there is no current flow, this acts as a way to keep it from getting backed up. It's hard to explain. I think the best uh, thing I read was if you're don't know what a grid leak does, uh, forget to install one and then you will know what a grid leak does. 
But anyway, it, it acts as a place for those the stray current to go to ground and dissipate out of the out of the chain here, and also adds a uh, reference to ground for your grid. All right, so that's one, two, and three, and then the fourth and final one, which we didn't talk about yet, was the cathode bias resistor. So here's our power tube. Here's our cathode, pin A, and we have a 470 ohm resistor. And a good metaphor for this is if you hop into your car and you put the gas pedal all the way to the floor, your tachometer is going to redline. And if you continue to drive it like that, you're going to blow your engine. What the cathode bias resistor does is it sets the operating point for this tube and it keeps it from redlining it. It governs, you know, where or how hard you drive in this tube. Uh, if you want to do more research into that, type in load lines into the search function and we'll see you next year. All right, so there you go. Four different types of resistors. And there's also only a uh, couple of types of capacitors. We have our filter caps, which we talked about which is to store charge and as the amp calls for the charge puts a demand on the need for it it will supply voltage to the amplifier and keep it from sagging but it also eliminates ripple after we change the ac from the wall into dc because of the way a rectifier works uh, it's not a straight smooth line of dc voltage it's got ripple it's bumpy and these eliminate the bumps and the more filtering you have, the smoother that line is. So that's the first type. Second type is going to be a coupling capacitor. And that is to couple the plate of one stage to the grid of the next stage. Because we do not want, you know, high DC voltage on our grid. We just want the amplified guitar signal. And a coupling capacitor, that is a capacitor in series will block DC. So there will be DC coming out of our power supply up to here. It can only go to the plate. It can't go in this direction. So that's the second type of capacitor, coupling capacitor. Third type is a bypass capacitor. And just to very oversimplify it, this uh, will give your tube more juice. It's probably not a good explanation, but in a nutshell, it'll give you more oomph. And then finally, we have, uh, we don't have it on this circuit, but we can use them in combinations with resistors as either a high-pass filter or a low-pass filter. And that's where you got your low, middle, and treble volume stack. And we use these in different combinations to either shave off high frequencies and only let low frequencies go through, or vice versa. And again, Use your search function if you want to know more about that. So there you go. There's four of each, I think, uh, there is. You know, it's not a, a, an endless, vast wilderness of stuff you need to know. You know, once you uh, understand, you know, those four ways that these components are used, uh, you're well on your way to understanding vacuum tube amplifiers. How about that? Uh, hopefully I didn't misspeak. Hopefully my analogies were good metaphors and uh hopefully this amp works or um we're gonna look like a dummy i feel like i'm banging my head against the wall yeah you could learn a lot from a dummy all yeah, right uh what's next all right let's get this sucker up and running all right now it's time to connect the primary of the power transformer so hopefully you can see this we have our plug that goes into the wall and on the hot side we're going to fuse it um they don't have oh fuse see on the old style they would fuse the neutral we're not going to fuse the neutral we're going to have a fuse on the hot side and then we're not going to have a death cap and then the other side is just going to be a straight shot and it's probably easier to understand if you're actually looking at it all right, right here, I've already started, probably should have waited. So right here is our where our power cord comes in. The black wire is for hot, the white wire is for neutral. 
The green wire is our equipment grounding conductor, or I guess they call it safety ground as well. And when you're looking at your plug, the if it's not polarized and both these tabs are the same size, the one on your left is your hot. All right, so we can come in out of the wall and some people wire the fuse first, other people wire the switch first. I like to wire the fuse first and I'm gonna have to add a little bit onto here. There are two connections for the fuse. So coming out of the wall, you want to go to the back of the fuse because if the fuse blows, and you go in there, you unscrew the cap, and say the, the fuse itself is still inside the holder, and you've wired the, the front lug right here, you know, somebody grabs that fuse to yank it out, they're gonna get zapped with a buck 20. So that's why coming out of the wall, we go to the back, and we come out of the, the front tab, we're gonna go to our switch. And I like using a double pull, single throw, so we can switch both the hot and the neutral lines of your power plug. So we come out of the, uh, the front of the fuse holder. I'm going to go to the common on this side. And came out of the wall with the neutral common on the other pole. And then we have our two primary wires from our power transformer. And they're going to go right here. One to each of these terminals. Pretty simple stuff. All right, hopefully that made sense, and let's. Uh, there's nothing to it but to do it. All right, there she is. Basically, a champ in a day. I think it's done. Looks to be done. We're gonna find out in a minute. Not the prettiest thing in the world, you know. She ain't pretty, but she's my brother. Corporate All right, let's juice her up, see what happens. All right, we got her plugged into the current limiter, which is plugged into the Variac. And I don't film me um, dialing it up for the very first time, you know, initially, uh, because if something is going to go catastrophically wrong, that's when it's going to happen. So I don't need that distraction. But I dialed it up real slow. And if there was a dead short in here, the filament of the current limiter light bulb would glow. And that would let me know immediately that, you know, there's a dead short in here. That hasn't happened, so I slowly turned it up to about 40 volts. Checked voltages, made sure I had AC where I needed AC, like on the filaments and on the um, uh, plates of the rectifier tube. This is my brain there for a second. Uh, check for DC on the cathode of the rectifier tube, um, high voltage, you know, all the normal stuff. Everything looked like, it, you know, there was nothing cattywampus. So I got it now dialed up to 80 volts from the wall, AC, going into the amp. And, um, yeah, let's see uh, what we got here. Let's see what we built, if anything. Oh yeah! And it's not going to sound great because we're only giving it 80 volts from the wall, but... So far, so good. All right, I'm going to dial her up the rest of the way, but I'm going to do that in private because, again, if this is going to go catastrophically wrong, uh, well, it probably would be fun to record that, but um, yeah, check back with you in a second. 
All right, hopefully you can see the meter. Uh, what do we got? 118 from the wall. And I should probably recheck these voltages off of the current limiter, but I'm going to let her settle in and make sure there's no problems before I take it off the training wheels. But at the first node, get this, can you see that? Hopefully you can see that. I'm going to test voltages at the three nodes. So straight off the rectifier at the first cap, then after the first dropping resistor, and after the second dropping resistor. So at the first point, we should have 365 volts. We have 386, so we're about 20 over. At the second node, we should have 317, and we have 332. And then at the third node, according to Rob Robinette anyway, we should have 271 volts. We have 248, so that's weird. The first two are high, and the last one is low. But we'll recheck after we get the amp off the current limiter. And not a whole lot we can do about the first node. i got to think about this a little bit. But so far, it sounds pretty good. This is with a shitty crate uh, speaker. I think it's a 10 inch. Just on the bench, so it's not going to sound great. But volume is at about 25%. So, was that 9 o'clock? Halfway up. And now let's crank it. Yeah, so far so good. Hopefully my horrible guitar playing doesn't uh, bother you too bad. But yeah, this is definitely a step up from the last version of this thing that I built. Uh, there's no more hum. Yeah, I think it had like transformer hum. And it was a constant hum regardless wherever the volume pot was. That is eliminated. This thing is, I mean, it's cranked up to 10 and it's basically silent. So that's gone. And again, it's cranked up to 10, and we're not getting the oscillation, so that problem's been solved. Yeah, so far, so good. I think if we just, you know, play with the <clears throat> dropping resistors a little bit and get the voltages more in line of where they should be, uh, this thing will be just about perfect. You know, I'm really surprised at how quiet this thing is. I mean, this is kind of a mess. You know, I got grid wires crossing heater wires and stuff like that, but it's... It's silent. Damn. Ooh, getting washed out here. Here we go. Yeah, let's lower her in the cab and uh, hook her up to the eminent speaker and see what we get. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this. Hey, you pipe down. Um, if you see on the power tube there, we have a couple of resistors. And I added a 470 ohm screen resistor and a 1.5K grid stopping resistor. So on this screen connection right here, before it comes off of the second 
filter cap and in between here and the screen lug of the tube socket I have a 470 ohm I believe that's a uh, 2 or 3 watt resistor and then over here between this node right here with the coupling cap and the grid leak and the pin 5 grid lug on the tube socket I have a 1.5k grid stopper resistor and both of those things as we discussed earlier are to stop oscillation and it seems to have worked here's one little quality of life upgrade I'm gonna do these uh, dress washers I'm gonna put a regular washer behind it because if you don't this is just gonna act like a cookie cutter and cut out a you know a washer shaped piece of Tolex you know as you tighten the screw down so just putting another washer behind the dress washer will stop that from happening. Let's see, it's already starting to happen from the factory, but we don't want it to get any worse. Yeah, it's looking nice. Look at that, look at that badass Sylvania. That's a nice tube, black plate. And we have our Browning 12AX7. As we know, the Browning name is the penultimate name in quality. And then we have the... What did we say that was? Softec? I'll say about Vintage 1, 5Y3 kicking around. I'm not sure if I do or not. But, uh, yeah. Nice. Couldn't be happier. Alright. Dug through the stash and we found a nice Vintage GE, 5Y3, GT. GE, GT. Looks like black plates or, I don't know, dark gray plates. Good stuff there. That should be nice. And, uh, that'll actually go good with, uh, Buddy's, what is this, 5751, made by General Electric as well. Here you are, 5751, made in the USA. I'll have to find a uh, GE 6V6. Let me see if I can find a GE 6V6, and we'll be an all GE amp. And then we'll bring some good things to life. All right, we got the chassis inside the cabinet. And there's a little bit of hum now. We get this little ground thing going on here. When I touch the um, volume knob, not sure what that's all about, but we'll figure that out. And I used a, a shitty um, El Cheapo China volume pot because I didn't have a one meg pot in stock. Uh, but yeah, she sounds so much better than the last version of this. I don't know what the hell I did wrong last time. But it sounds like a champ should sound. Uh, here you see my first attempt. Actually, this is my second attempt. This is when I made it look a little better. But I should go back and fix this, you know, grill cloth that I did there. It's a little wavy. And um, the owner of this amp will take issue with that because he's a guitar player. And that's what they do. But, uh, yeah, we got it hooked up to the Eminent speaker. And, yeah, it sounds really nice.
This little lamp is awesome. Sounds a little boxy, but that kind of actually gives it a little bit of its charm. And I think the best way to use this thing is just turn it all the way up and use the volume on your guitar. Because you can basically go from crystal clean to, you know, Joe Walsh. It could definitely benefit from a, a tone knob. It is a little, I don't want to say it's quite woolly, but it could definitely use some more high end, but whatever. But I, I, I could do that all day long. That sounds so great. I'm using the wrong pick. That noise is just because I'm sitting next to my computer. If I put it in the middle position, it doesn't do that. sensibilities with my horrible guitar playing we have a success um, just a couple of other little things to do I need to go back in there and check the bias uh, see if there's anything I could do I gotta replace that volume pot so I'm not gonna worry about that and uh, what else did we need to do oh yeah just check on those voltages uh, coming off of the B plus nodes but this thing sounds so good right now I, I don't think we should try to fix something that doesn't appear to be broken but there you go. We built a champ in a weekend. We finished. Finally, I think we can almost call the very first project I ever started finished. You know, that's why I've had this little amplifier in my house for three years, because I was just never satisfied with the way it came out. But now I couldn't be happier. Sounds like a tweed champ should. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you learned something. I certainly did. And uh, come back for more. We got a lot of cool shit coming out. Rock on dudes and dudettes.